human nature, not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things And I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case Open and shut No doubt about it I'm a nature nut Hi there. Today our subject is the world of worms. And we might as well start out by asking ourselves the important question, what exactly is a worm anyway? Of course, the term worm encompasses a number of different sorts of creatures, but all of them have no arms, no legs, and no backbone. Admittedly, these are not the most popular sorts of creatures among naturalists and nature nuts, but worminess if you don't mind my using that expression. Worminess gets to the very heart of animal existence because there is a saying among zoologists, you've probably heard it, life, it's just a bunch of tubes. Let me explain that. Almost every living animal creature on Earth has this as its basic structure. A tube, food goes in one end, comes out the other end, some of it is processed, in the middle and the tube grows bigger. But a tube like this couldn't survive on its own. It has to, you know, it has to have a few extra tubes associated with it. Here's another tube, we'll call this one the circulatory system. The heart, pump blood around, spread the uh, process or the products of uh, digestion to the rest of the tube. And we'll have another tube here. This is a uh, nervous system. Coordinate the movements of the tube. I'll just thicken her at the front there. There you go. A brain. These tubes have to find themselves inside a larger tube, a master tube, or they'll never be able to get around. We'll put them in there. Inside the big tube, you're going to have muscles, maybe a few other things like. Uh, you know, an excretory system and stuff like that. Oh, jeez, the nervous system's just hanging out there. Don't you hate it when your nervous system just hangs out? Anyway, there we go. And what else do we need? Of course, we need a reproductive system so that it can make more tubes. You wouldn't want the first tube to be the last tube. And voila, the essence of animal life, the tube worm. How's it feeling? Uh, you're talking to the wrong end there, John. Uh, no, I'm not. There's the brains at this end. I'm sorry, uh, my mistake. It's easy. Don't blame you. Usually on the head end of your basic worm, there are sense organs so that the worm can recognize where its own head is. Things like little light-sensitive cells and, you know, stuff like that. And, of course, the mouth. So there you go. The essence of animal life, the tube. I quite agree. You know, there are a lot of different sorts of critters that are zoologically known as worms. There's round worms, and there's flat worms, and there's hookworms, and pinworms, and tapeworms. But most of the time when we say the word worm, we mean earthworms, the kind of worms that you find in your garden. Oligochaete worms in the phylum Annelida, annelid worms. And you know what annelid means? It means ringed. And if you have a look at your basic worm, you can see here, this one is not quite an adult worm. So I can't do this segment with this worm. I have to stop talking now. <laughs> In Australia, a major survey of earthworms was performed with the help of the country's school children. The reason they're called annelids is because annelid means ringed, and the body, if you have a close look at it, 
is made up of little rings, with, of course, the tubes of the digestive system and all the other systems going through those rings. Each ring is a separate segment, and that's, uh, that's kind of a cool thing in and of itself. If I had accidentally cut this worm with the shovel, which happens quite a bit in the garden, somewhere near the middle of the body, the back end of the body could regrow a new front end, and the front end could regrow a new back end, as long as the injury wasn't, you know, too severe, which is kind of interesting, but it also brings up the question of how you can tell the front end from the back end. Let me give you a quick lesson on worm anatomy. This pointy end here, the light colored end, that's the front end. That's where the head is, and the mouth, and the brain. This blunt end at the back, that's the back end, the tail end, where the anus is. And about the only other thing you can see on this worm, if you roll it around a bit, it has a, a little bit of a light bit. Right here, you see those few segments that are lighter in color and a bit thicker? That little collar is called the clitellum, and that tells you it's an adult worm rather than a juvenile worm, an immature worm. And I'm not even sure if this is a fully adult worm, but you know, there's no real value to knowing whether a worm is an adult worm. It's just one of those things you either care about or you don't. Watch for the clitellum. That's the key. Worm anatomy. Not much to it. Simplicity and elegance in a tube critter. In Australia, there are giant earthworms four meters long. This is worm watching. Pay close attention. It's not like bird watching. Worms don't do a lot of complex things. Mostly they just sort of wiggle and stretch and become shorter and become longer. And that's how worms get around. It's kind of neat. It's kind of fun to watch worms stretch up and squonk down. Very cool. You know how they do it? It's very, very complicated in a rather simple way. Each segment of the worm, and there are hundreds of segments, is like a little balloon. And of course, it has its own muscles, and there are a set of muscles that push the segment front to back to make it nice and fat so that it'll stick out against the sides of the worm's burrow. And there are little, you can feel a little bristles on the side of a worm if you feel a worm, and those, you know, grab onto the ground. And then there's another set of muscles that go all the way around each segment, and when those contract, the segment becomes long and skinny, and that part of the worm can shoot forward or backward, whichever way the worm's pointing. So, that's the essence of worm movement, which in turn is the essence of worm behavior. Why do they have to move around in the first place? The usual reasons, to find food, to find mates, and to get away from danger. There are only two species of native earthworm in Canada. Both are rare denizens of places that were never glaciated. Now right after a rain, or actually in the middle of a rain, can be a great time to go worm watching, because worms seem to show up on the sidewalk all the time. And you might wonder why that's the case. In the old days, they used to think that these worms were sick, but that's not the real reason. The real reason is they're just going about their normal foraging activities, and they just wander out onto the sidewalk, where, of course, they can't drill back down into the ground, and if it stops raining and the sun comes out, they become marooned. You know, worm watching has never been a real popular activity among nature nuts, but it got a great start. The first true worm watcher was none other than Charles Darwin, who wrote a whole book about worms defending his theory. Controversial theory, not the one you're thinking about. His worm theory, that's what I'm talking about. 
I'm about to perform an experiment with some worms here, but before I do, let me tell you a bit about it. Many decades ago, I, it occurred to me that perhaps the formation of vegetable mold was the product of the action of worms. And I was quite pleased with this theory at the time. I published it, and approximately 20 years later, it was violently attacked in print by a, a certain Mr. Fish. Imagine a man named Fish taking taking a crack at a theory about worms. There's a certain irony to that, I thought, so I felt I should defend myself, and I ret I'd had a bit of trouble with another theory of mine, and I felt I needed a break, so I began to study worms. Now, I have some worms here. Did you know, by the way, that in Britain alone, in one acre of land, worms bring about 18 tons of vegetable mold to the surface each year? It's a shocking fact and quite remarkable. In any case, there are some worms in this terrine, the Wedgwood terrine. I married into the Wedgwood family, got quite a bit of free china in the bargain, and there are some worms in here. I'm going to do the experiment to determine if worms are sensitive to vibration. First of all, we give them a bit of airborne sound in the form of recorder music. High pitched, rather oriental in character, but I'm a scientist, not a musician. And the worms could care less, they could care less. But if I strike a chord on the piano, vibrations are transmitted through the piano and up through the substrate. them crazy with anxiety. As you can see, they've all shot down their barrels, and quite obviously they can feel vibrations through the substrate. They cannot hear vibrations through the air. It's a very interesting fact, and I'm quite proud to report it. It's, it's all in my book, the Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Actions of Worms with Observations on Their Habits, it's available at fine booksellers everywhere. Let's talk about worm enemies for a moment here. You know, there are about a dozen species of worm, earthworm that is, in this part of the world, and not a single one of them is native to North America. They all came over here with European farmers and European gardeners, and when they did that, they left their natural enemies back home in Europe. But of course, your basic earthworm found here a formidable enemy, the American robin. American robins, they love to prowl around on lawns or hop around on lawns, tilt their heads, and they yank worms right out of the ground. You've all seen it. Worms that you and I would never even suspect are there. It's a bit of a mystery how they do that, but, you know, who knows? Maybe it's not that hard. It reminds me of the the story of the great physicist Richard Feynman, who thought that perhaps the human sense of smell was underrated compared to that of dogs. So he got a friend to walk across a, a, uh, a carpeted floor, then he put on a blindfold, or maybe he put on the blindfold first, and then he followed his friend's trail, his friend was in bare feet, with his own nose, and realized that, hey, people can do that too, it's just that nobody tries. So maybe the thing to do is to try to find worms like a robin. Maybe it's easier than we think. Now, how do they do it? They sort of hop along, and then they listen. Or at least it looks like they're listening. I guess maybe if I'd shut up, I'd have a better chance of hearing the worm. There is some controversy, though. I guess ornithologists now think robins actually watch for worms. We've done quite a bit of experiments to that effect. So let's try that instead. A little bit of both. When a robin turns its head, of course, its eyeball is on the side, so that's just as good for watching as it is for listening. Man, you ever notice how messy your average lawn is? Thank you. 
I just realized even if I did find one, I don't have a pointy beak. I could never get it out of the ground. This might have to remain an unsolved scientific mystery. Worm fossils are rare because worms have no hard body parts, but fossils of their burrows are more common. Well, here we are back at the dear old beaver pond. And I want to show you a few other sorts of worms, you know, other than earthworms. I don't know what we'll get in here. We might just get really lucky and get a horsehair worm. They just look like a long skinny hair. And you'd think they'd have gone extinct years ago from tying themselves in too many knots, but apparently that's not the case. They don't mind being in knots. Okay, this will do it. Sufficient worm mature for my purposes. Okay, let me just dump her in the white pail here so we can see what we got. And come over and have a look. Okay, well there's a couple of wormy things in here in among all the orange Daphnia pinging around. Just ignore those for the moment. This guy here 
is called a glass worm, but it probably shouldn't be called a worm at all because it's not zoologically a worm. It's actually the larva of a fly called a phantom midge. So what it is, is it's a very fancy sort of a maggot with a little air bubble at each end so that it can hang perfectly level in the water. It's a carnivore too, a little killer maggot, the glass worm. And then here, this big guy and this little one over here, those are both leeches. And if you have a look at them, you'll notice that they have the same sort of ringed structure as an earthworm. And sure enough, they are annelid worms as well. Leeches. I'm not sure if these particular leeches are bloodsuckers or not. Not all leeches are bloodsuckers. Some of them are even, you know, useful in a medical sense. I don't know if I'd go for that myself, but hey, why not? Who knows? Anyway, there you go. A little bit more worm diversity. Something to think about when you're at the beaver farm. In most places, and especially the tropics, ants turn over more soil than earthworms. Okay, well, I guess we're just about out of worm time here. I should mention a few other things. Uh, worm composting. That's a very popular thing these days. In this box are about 300 red worms, and they just eat kitchen scraps. It's great. It's kind of a composting thing. Those worms, they'll munch it up. They'll form some beautiful kind of worm mulch that I can put in with my potted plants. You can... Uh, you know, feed the worms to your fish if you have pet fish, or you can use the resulting worm mulch for uh, helping out with your potted plants. It's kind of a lot of fun. I should also tell you that I have to make an admission here. Those worms, Charles Darwin's worms, they were fake worms. They've got little strings attached to them. And the worm I used in the fishing bit, it was a fake worm too. We never actually hurt any real worms in this show. So there you go. And to finish up, my wife made me this beautiful worm pudding. Isn't it nice? Inside this pot is some uh, chocolate pudding. It's got Oreo cookie crumbles for, uh, for dirt, some plastic flowers, and there are gummy worms crawling around inside the dirt. Mmm, that's real good. You know, if you want a basic rule for life, if you're gonna eat worms, only eat gummy worms. That's my advice to you. Anyway, until next time, see you later. I'm a nature nut, and I hope you are too. Worm pudding. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut.